Roswell is just the tip of the iceberg. They want us to believe in weather balloons and misidentified aircraft. But there are other locations, hushed up incidents the government would rather we forget. Prepare to uncover the hidden crash sites and the shocking secrets they might still hold. Now, Argentine researcher Marcelo Igazusta found what he believes to be an underwater alien base. The object is 8.5 miles long and it seems to be a pyramid of some kind. It's located right off the coast of Mexico near the ancient Aztec and Mayan pyramids, which could be coincidental or totally random. Since this pyramid has an 8.5 mile base, that catapults it into being the biggest pyramid in the world. Forget Egypt, humans could have never built something like that, especially underwater, so Marcelo believes only aliens could have accomplished it. I mean, cut us some more slack, we're better than that. He believes either the base was there from before or an alien craft landed in the water and was built to do so and they just never left. And coming in at number 9 is the Arctic landing. So okay, bit of fake advertisement, this one isn't located in the Arctic, it's actually located in Antarctica. Not the same thing you guys. Either way, Russian UFO enthusiast Valentin Degretev claims he found an alien crash site in Antarctica. There seems to be a saucer shaped dent in the snow like the flying saucer landed on its side and just went straight through the snow. I hope you got what I meant when I did that. <laughs> I mean, I need to speculate and offer other explanations like, okay, is the ice breaking apart underneath there and that's what's causing the slit? But I feel like that's far-fetched, but then again, so is a flying saucer. But it is peculiar and it's surrounded by ridges and flat snow, so it's just a big unexplainable anomaly. I don't know, guys. Is it just a random slit? Is it an alien saucer? I don't really know. At number 8 we have the Martian Twins. Now during the Kofun era in Japan, which was during 300 to 538 AD, they used to build Kofun tombs. And these tombs were for people of the ruling class and they were shaped like keyholes most commonly and surrounded by water. That's all well and good, but alien hunters spotted a mound on Mars that looked identical to one specific Kofun era tomb. Now they fully believe that the suspicious similarities between both features is evidence that Martians settled on Earth centuries ago after a catastrophic unknown event forced them to leave the red planet. They ended up building a similar structure on Earth and then going back to Mars when it was finally appropriate. But again, I feel like this whole theory is speculation. How do we know what this catastrophic unknown event was and if it even happened? If aliens have the technology to travel to another planet and set up camp there, surely they could have evaded whichever terrible thing happened on Mars? Is that too much to ask? I don't think it is. I don't think my expectations are that high you guys. Plausible. In our number 7 spot today we have the Aguadilla Airport Incident. The Aguadilla Airport UFO incident occurred on April 25th, 2013, when a strange object was spotted hovering above the Rafael Hernandez Airport in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. The object was initially detected by radar and later confirmed by security cameras as a glowing, unidentified object that appeared to be traveling at a low altitude. The object was described as being around 4 to 5 feet in length and it moved very quickly and very erratically. It was also observed to emit a bright white light and appeared to be changing shape. The incident attracted widespread attention and was investigated by several government agencies, including the Federal Aviation Administration and the Department of Homeland Security. The object was ultimately classified as an unidentified flying object or UFO, and no explanation was given for its presence in the area. It is even said that a US Customs and Border Protection aircraft actually captured infrared video of the incident that was given to the Scientific Coalition for UFOlogy by a whistleblower. This video is said to to show the UFO traveling at super low altitudes, sometimes lower than the treetops, but at speeds close to 100 miles per hour. The Aguadilla Airport UFO incident is considered one of the most significant UFO sightings in recent history due to the high level of documentation and the involvement of government agencies. It continues to be a topic of discussion and speculation among UFO enthusiasts and researchers and has contributed to ongoing efforts to uncover the truth about the nature and origin of UFO sightings around the world. In our number 6 spot today we have the Project Blue Book sighting. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Richard French was once tasked with being an investigator for Project Blue Book, which was the name used to describe a study of UFOs conducted by the United States Air Force from March 1952 to December 17th, 1969 when the project was terminated. Okay, we talk about Project Blue Book a lot, you gotta know what it is. While his job was meant to be to investigate and essentially debunk UFO sightings, later in life he took to Congress to stand up and 
and explain his own UFO encounter that he was never able to explain away. The moment that truly stuck with him all of these years took place back in 1952 when he was sent off to Newfoundland after there were reports of a UFO that had crashed off of the coast of St. John's. As he arrived to the scene, there were at least 100 people who all stood and stared into the water, and as he was able to follow their gaze and see what they were all looking at, he couldn't quite believe his eyes. He recalled the water being quite clear, and under it you could see two circular crafts, each one approximately 18 feet in diameter. He said that they were both floating just below the surface of the water, no more than 20 feet from the shore, and not only this, but he could also see two beings with the crafts. He said, quote, the first thing I saw was the UFOs, and it was apparent to me that they were doing something to the craft, and I couldn't really tell what, because they were on the bottom side of it and not visible to me, except when they would occasionally get over to the side where I could see them. He claims he watched on as the beings worked on the craft until one of them raised out of the water and disappeared, but not before accelerating to speeds in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 miles per hour. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Coin Mansfield Helicopter Incident. The Coin Mansfield Helicopter UFO Incident occurred on October 18, 1973, when four members of the Ohio Army National Guard were flying in a helicopter over Mansfield, Ohio. Suddenly, they encountered a large metallic disc-shaped object that was hovering in the sky. The object began to move towards the helicopter, causing the crew to take evasive maneuvers. Despite their efforts, the object continued to follow them, eventually passing overhead and disappearing into the distance. The crew reported the incident to their superiors, and an investigation was launched by the military and the Federal Aviation Administration. The incident received significant media attention, and it remains one of the most compelling UFO sightings on record. What makes this incident particularly intriguing is the credibility of the witnesses. The crew were all experienced pilots with military training, and their account of the incident was corroborated by radar data and other witnesses on the ground. Despite extensive investigations, no satisfactory explanation has ever been offered for what they saw that day. In our number 4 spot today, we have Apollo 11. So we can sit here on Earth all day and talk about the potential for alien life and UFOs, but who would know more than the people who have actually been to space, which are of course astronauts. Definitely on the list of coolest and scariest jobs in the world, there haven't been a ton of people who have had the unbelievable privilege of experiencing space firsthand, but there are even less of them who have claimed to see something that seems completely unexplainable. People who have claimed these sorts of things include Edgar Mitchell, Catherine Coleman, and Dr. Brian O'Leary. The very interesting part about many of these claims is that they also include some sort of government cover-up as well with their claims. There was also Buzz Aldrin, who spoke about his Apollo 11 experience, and he detailed the crew seeing something flying alongside them, and at first they believed it was the final stage of a detached rocket, but then Mission Control confirmed that it was actually 6,000 miles away from them, leaving them with no answers on what the flying object could be. I can't imagine going to space at all, let alone encountering a UFO flying right beside you. Also, I can't believe that I hadn't heard of that story before, because to me, that sounds like full-blown alien contact. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Go Faster video. In 2017, after the existence of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program became more well known, a video was released of an encounter between an FA-18 Super Hornet and some sort of unidentified flying object. This video was the third in a series of three videos, and there weren't a ton of details released about exactly what happened during this encounter. Using the Raytheon Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared Pod, they were able to capture an extremely fast moving white oval that was around 45 feet long. The oval had no wings and didn't appear to have any kind of exhaust either. They were tracking the UFO at an altitude of 25,000 feet just above the Atlantic Ocean, and then they were shocked as the craft rotated on its axis and flew away. There was no explanation released with the footage because it truly is unbelievable and currently unexplainable. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Delphos Ring Incident. The Delphos Ring UFO incident occurred on November 2nd, 1971 in Delphos, Kansas, when a family witnessed a strange object hovering over their farm. The UFO emitted a bright light that illuminated the surrounding area and left a glowing ring in the ground after it disappeared. The family reported the incident to the local sheriff, who took a sample of the ring for analysis. Investigations were conducted by several experts, including the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, who collected soil samples and found that the ring was caused by the removal 
level of topsoil, which had been exposed to a high amount of heat. Additionally, a high level of radiation was also detected at the site. The incident received widespread media coverage and sparked debates about the existence of extraterrestrial life and the possibility of alien visitation. Some skeptics argued that the incident could have been caused by natural phenomena or a hoax, but the witnesses maintained that they saw a genuine UFO. Despite the years of investigation it's been, no conclusive explanation for the incident has been found, leaving the mystery of the Delphos Ring UFO unsolved. In our number one spot today, we have the Shag Harbor incident. This incident took place on October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object as it crashed, and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting out on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange at the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as a brilliantly lit rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing it. Shortly after they first noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. Loud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy, he saw four blips on its DECA radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and this is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board either. The entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched. A man named Lori Wickens was another one of the witnesses, and he and some friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted police because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean but a thousand feet offshore. This is all super weird and not only the RCMP but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in the investigation but nothing was ever recovered or found. It was also revealed that all commercial, private and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were accounted for, so what could have all those witnesses seen? Since they never officially identified what it was, in the official Government of Canada documents it is listed as a UFO. Number 10, Triangle Object. The Defense Department has confirmed that leaked photos and videos of an unidentified aerial phenomenon taken in 2019 are indeed legitimate images of unexplained objects. Photos and videos of triangle shaped objects blinking and moving through the clouds were taken by Navy personnel, Pentagon spokeswoman Sue Go said in a statement to CNN. She also confirmed that photos of three unidentified flying objects, one spear shaped, another acorn shaped, and one carrier characterized as a metallic blimp were also taken by Navy personnel. As we have said before, to maintain operation security and to avoid disclosing information that may be useful to potential adversaries, DOD does not discuss publicly the details of either the observations or the examinations of reported incursions into our training ranges or designated airspace, including those incursions initially designed as UAP, she said. She also said that the Identified Aerial Phenomena Task Force created to investigate UFO sightings observed by the military has included these incidents in their ongoing examinations. Number 9. Drone Footage On April 19th, 2023, the Pentagon released another video featuring MQ-9 drone footage from the Middle East depicting a UAP. In the footage dated July 12th, 2022, which the US Defense Department shared online, the US military's MQ-9 Reaper drone, somewhere in the Middle East, exactly where wasn't disclosed, can be seen monitoring a strange metallic silver orb-like object flying around below it at some seemingly high speeds while the drone's camera tries to follow it. This footage is significant because while there have been previously declassified US military footage of UFOs, those were all taken by pilots in manned aircrafts. This one, however, was taken by a drone. However, this isn't the only time this particular UFO has been seen. Apparently, there has been many other sightings of a strange metallic orb in the Middle East. Sean M. Kirkpatrick, director of the Pentagon's All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, told a Senate 
Armed Services Subcommittee that it resembled a small metallic orb. He added there isn't an explanation for, but the reason for is due to lack of available data. It is going to be virtually impossible to fully identify that just based on that video, he said, according to ABC News. Number 8. ADAR The Pentagon's new office for investigating potential UFO sightings received hundreds of news reports in 2022, and while it can explain more than half of these events, a sizable chunk remains a mystery. Within the new batch of sightings, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office and the Office of Director of National Intelligence say they're focusing on some 171 cases, including some in which objects appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities and require further analysis. Since it was formed last summer, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office has received 366 reports of UAP. That total reflects 247 new UAP reports and another 119 that occurred before March 2021 but hadn't been included in the earlier report. The new numbers indicate a steep rise in UAP sightings. Now, the report released in June 2021 lists just 144 reports covering a 17 year period. With the subsequent additions, 510 UAP reports were in their files at the end of August 2022. Officials say they believe the rise in UAP reports is due to the US government's effort to destigmatize the topic of UAP and instead recognize the potential risks the phenomenon poses, both with aviation hazard and potential advisable activity, such as foreign surveillance efforts. Number seven, recent sighting. A low quality blurred image said to depict a UFO or a weird object escorted by two military aircraft over northeastern Italy made the news. The photograph was published by some local media outlets, which reported that around 7:20 p.m. on March 23rd, 2021, several witnesses noticed two aircrafts coming from the southeast and heading northwest, escorting from distance what was described as a large square or diamond shaped object, which incorporated from 10 to 12 fixed yellow lights. According to the reports, the object traveled very fast and left behind an intense trail, and the only noise that was perceived was that of the two planes flying at a lower altitude than the square object at a much lower speed. One and a half minutes was the average duration of these sightings, enough to spark discussion of what this mysterious object was. So much so, the photograph was also brought to the attention of the Italian for National UFO Center, which started its own investigation. Number six. 22nd sighting. There are episodes in Italy which whole crowds have witnessed inexplicable phenomena. On October 13th, 2016, a series of people spotted a UFO in the sky over Geneva. The sighting lasts for 20 seconds, and there are those who had time to take photos or videos from different points in the city. The Air Force was contacted immediately, but no trace of the object was found in radar tracks. It seems like we'll never know what this strange object was, but I believe the people who saw it. Number five. Pilot Discovery. On June 18th, 1979, the then pilot marshal Giancarlo Sinsoni was returning from a photographic survey. Giancarlo, who belonged to the 14 group of the two fighter bomber reconnaissance wing of the Italian Air Force, was on board a G91R equipped with four Vitton cameras located in this way two on the sides of the front of the cockpit, one in the front position, and the fourth at the ventral position. With these, he had carried out the photographic surveys that he had been in charge of, but while Flying, he saw something strange. He then arranged with the ground control body staff to go and identify an object that was detected by the radar. At the moment of the sighting, it occurred to him that it could be a solar UFO, but then he realized it was something different. The day was beautiful, and he soon realized that the black spot had very different characteristics. It appeared to him in the shape of a dull black fuel tank, and on its slightly flattened upper part, he noticed a fairing with two mustaches. This was underlying something clear and white which, in his opinion, was a kind of milky white dome. The characteristics of the surface did not allow the refraction of light, and the object appeared to have a length of about 6 to 8 meters and a width of about 3 meters. Now, during the sighting, which lasted about 5 minutes, Giancarlo was able to take more than 80 photographs that showed the object was always in the same frontal position or slightly angled. In fact, this thing was never completely visible from the side, and it was as if the thing wanted to aim the plane. Number 4. 
Or factory worker. On April 24th, 1950, a factory worker named Bruno Facciani was working the late shift and stepped outside to get some fresh air on his break. Investigating a bright glowing light, which he thought was a part of a factory transformer problem, he was shocked to see a circular shape glowing object with a ladder descended from its bottom. At the top of the UFO was a greenish glow which partially obscured a light skinned being. The unusual being appeared to be welding something on the craft. Then he said several other small alien creatures emerged from the craft, and in a moment or two, the ladder began to be drawn up into the mysterious craft, and the beings began to re-enter the craft through an invisible door of some kind. The full realization of what he was witnessing sent Bruno to run away from the frightening encounter. Now as he fled, he heard a sound like that of a large beehive. One of the remaining creatures pointed a type of weapon at him, and a beam of force knocked him to the ground. Although in pain, he was able to watch the aliens as they prepared the craft to take off. The beehive like sound increased as the object made its way into the skies and vanished from view. Now, the next day, Bruno made a full report of his encounter to the police force, and there were signs still visible of the activities of the night before. Police found burn patches on the ground and indentation marks of an extremely heavy object. They also found some odd green pieces of a metal like substance. Number three, Green Alien. On the night of December 6, 1978, night watchman Piers Zanfretta was on a routine patrol when he stumbled into a series of terrifying encounters with extraterrestrial beings. His car inexplicably lost power en route to a client's unoccupied home. He then glanced through his window and saw four lights moving in the garden of the house he was coming to inspect. Assuming that the beams were coming from burglars, he climbed from his car with his revolver and flashlight in hand. Now, just as he prepared to leap out to confront these trespassers, he felt something touch his shoulder from behind. Here spun around, but instead of finding a human criminal, he saw an entity that he described as being an enormous green, ugly, and frightful creature with undiluting skin as though they were very fat or dressed in a loose gray tunic no less than 10 feet tall. He was flanked by two similar beasts. He said these beings were hairy, had greenish skin, had horns on the sides of their faces, yellow triangular eyes, and red veins in embedded in their foreheads. He also described a unique self-illuminated mechanical apparatus that fit over their mouths. Now he was so shocked that he ran away, and I think that was the best option. Number two, the abduction. In April 1962, Taylor Mario Zucala was walking home through the woods when at a crossroad clearing where the path crossed a small canal, he felt himself struck by a sharp gust of wind. Object like an inverted bowl passed overhead and came close to the ground about six to seven meters away. From its underside came a cylinder which opened up, revealing a diffuse of white light from which two beings emerged. They were one and a half meters tall, dressed in metallic suits, wearing helmets with antennas. He then approached Mario and led him into the empty interior of the object, which was lit by the same diffuse light. He was unable to make out any details of the interior. They then let go of him as a voice from the inner part of the object, like one amplified by a microphone, and as if were sounding in a vast space, spoke to him in Italian. The only part Mario could remember was a message that at the fourth moon they would return at one in the morning to give him a message for humanity. He was then escorted out of the object and somehow found himself outside his own door. His wife heard four loud knocks, which he does not remember making, and found him terrified on the front porch. And coming at number one is the whistleblower. Pentagon whistleblower David Grush, in some more baffling claims, said the Vatican was fully aware of non-human intelligence's existence and that it assisted the United States in retrieving a UFO. Making some shocking revelations, David stated that a top secret UFO retrieval program was run by the United States for decades and added that the Vatican was involved in the first ever crash of a UFO as per media reports. David stated that the UFO's first recovery took place in Magenta, Italy in 1933. He added that the UFO was in possession of Italian he added that the UFO was in possession of Italian dictator Mussolini's government until 1944 to 1945, when America was tipped off by it by Pope Pius XII. He added that the UFO was partially intact and was kept at a secure airbase until it was retrieved.
retrieved by the US after the fascist Italy's regime collapse. 1933 was the first recovery in Europe in Magenta, Italy. They recovered a partially intact vehicle and the Italian government moved it to a secure airbase in Italy until around 1944 to 1945. The Pope back channeled that and told the Americans what the Italians had and we ended up scooping it, David said. While clarifying whether the Catholic Church knew about the non-human existence on Earth, David said, certainly. He said that his claims must be believed because I have the credentials and I was an intelligence officer. He stated that UFO sightings were widely known during Mussolini's dictatorship in Italy. Coming in at number 10 is the orange disc. In 2020, a report of a UFO over the Vatican in 2007 came to life. UFO hunter Scott Waring believes the unidentified flying object's shape closely resembles a flying saucer. He said on his UFO sightings daily blog, this report is from 2007 but was just reported today at MUFON. An orange disc was caught in a photograph over Vatican City. UFOs have been seen over the Vatican before, but orange UFOs are usually seen in South America and Central America, so this is odd. The object is a disc viewed from the side. The disc doesn't have a classic hump, but instead its upper center comes to a point and lower center is flat, no bulge at all. For me, I can clearly see this is a disc. It's a little in focus, so it's not that far back. It looks to be about 10 meters, 33 feet across. If it was traveling fast, it may have gotten caught by accident. This is absolutely real and absolutely alien in origin. Then Scott said the Vatican stance of alien life comes mostly from scientific analysis of chemicals, substances, and textbook strategies of old. Vatican astronomers would never confirm any UFO as being real unless it landed in Vatican City. Number nine. First crash ever. The world's first crash of an unidentified flying object, UFO, happened in Italy in 1933 during the reign of Benito Mussolini, Italian researcher Robert Pinotti claimed. Roberto spoke to the Daily Mail and even shared evidence to back his claims. Now, Roberto is the president of the National Ufological Center in Italy, and his research has been met with skepticism within Italy itself. Now, Roberto and his colleague have been working to learn more about the 1933 crash in Lombardy and received some original secret documents about it in 1996. The documents were sent to the researchers by an unidentified source who claimed to have inherited these from a relative who lived at the time and was part of the secret department allegedly set up by Mussolini to study the saucer. Now, the documents also include handwritten memos that have a sketch and description of the UFO with portholes on the side. Donut UFO. In 1978, unidentified flying objects that gave off green, red, and white lights and had a donut like hole in the middle were reported and, in some cases, photographed at dozens of places between Sicily and Milan in the north. It was reported by none other than the officers on duty in the operation of police headquarters. Dozens of people called, all with the same message. You see an enormous beam of green light just overhead. A lieutenant and non commissioned officer, driven by curiosity, as they said later, ran out on the terrace and one exclaimed, I see an enormous beam of green light. A bank clerk, Nino Raffagino, said he spotted an object just before midnight, made a dash for his 1000 millimeter telephoto lens, and came up with a series of pictures that appeared in the press. One taken when the object was stationary, according to Nino, showed a disc of light with a hole in the middle. Officers that were alerted by citizens' calls also snapped pictures and sent them to the newspapers. Taken while the object appeared to be moving, they showed a long, wide streak of light in the dark sky. The filling on number seven slot is the alien base. Now, back in April of this year, a few UFO hunters were searching Google Earth for some sus looking and boy did they find it. There's this really weird 500 meter long object off the coast of Antarctica that from the top looks like an iceberg but literally isn't. The left of it is oddly straight and the top has vertical ridges on it making it not look like an iceberg at all. According to UFO sightings hotspot, it doesn't fit the description of an iceberg and I quote, I'm not an iceberg expert but this object is really peculiar and looks like a vessel disguised as an iceberg. I have to fully agree with you honestly, I feel like the Aliens were probably like, hey, just cover the top in an ice sheet. These dumb humans won't notice the difference. But we did. We are on to you. Dumb humans, 
may have taken us a few years, but we got there. Now at number 6 is bad parking. I just found this one hilarious because alien life is meant to be so advanced and ahead of us and I look at this image and I'm like, were you drunk driving? Like this is shockingly bad. Now the image was located by YouTube channel Secure Team 10 who found it crash landed in a restricted part of Arizona with a white blacked out car parked next to it. CIA perhaps? Probably. Now the flying saucer looks really old fashioned if anything, like it's not slick or thin and I'm pretty sure it landed upside down which is what's really funny to me. Like how do you mess up a landing that badly? Maybe the aliens decide to take one of the old ones for a ride and then didn't realize how outdated it was and then boom, disaster, flipped it over. You're gonna be grounded when you get back to your planet. Coming in at number 5 is the slit. In the very remote British territory of South Georgia, a really strange thing was found in the snow and no we're not talking about my ex but wow he keeps popping up in these videos. Now alien hunting YouTube channel Secure Team 10 found a slit in the snow that they claim has all the signs that point to a UFO crash landing. It has the exact trajectory of an angular flying object that came to a screeching halt in the snow. Now the imprint isn't a plane otherwise we would have known, it's not military craft or we would have known and the crash is too narrow and small to be anything other than an alien craft. But I mean I don't really know, I think calling every weird slit in the snow an alien crash landing is a bit of a cop out but alien hunters clearly know better than I do so I'ma just leave it to the experts. At number 4 is the flying saucer. Clearly you can tell I'm running out of title ideas and I mean there's only so many different ways you can say spaceship ok? Either way YouTube channel Secure Team found an image on Google Earth they believe is a flying saucer. Located in the south South Pole, the circular object in question is sticking out of a mountain amongst the snow. But the rocky areas around it are quite rigid and randomly cut, whereas this object is oddly round and like perfectly round at that. And I can't zoom in enough to tell if it's just a round cut of water that's randomly there or if it's actually alien aircraft. But since I've never seen alien aircraft, I don't even know even if I could zoom in, would I know? Who knows? Now there's like a thinner outline inside the actual outline of the round bit which seems unnatural to me like there's no way that bit's natural. Has to be man made or or alien made. But I feel like zooming in more is necessary to get an actual conclusion and alas I can't do that and I'm definitely not going to go to Antarctica just to find out. But you can, and let me know if you do. Filling our number 3 slot is the floating island. Now located in Argentina, back in 2016 UFO sightings daily fully believed this floating island was the entrance to an alien base. On google maps it looks like a random crescent was cut out of the greenery in the area, like there's no other shape like that found nearby or on the continent or in the country for that matter. The island actually moves and rotates in a circle and considering Argentina has had many UFO sightings over the years. it could be possible that aliens have their base underneath this island. Never say never. Now the slit could easily fit a 100 meter UFO through it and no one has actually gone and explored the water beneath the floating island. I think it's just really weird how there's like an oddly perfect circular island that magically got cut out by mother nature and oh it also rotates and moves. Like nah honey that's not mother nature that is alien nature. Now at number 2 are the skid marks. Now in June of this year UFO theorist Scott Waring found what he believed to be an alien crash site in Antarctica because apparently that's the go to landing pad for most aliens on this list. It's located towards the north of the island off the coast of another little island, if you know what that means because I don't since I'm not an Antarctica expert. Now on the image he claims part of the UFO's wing is folded up and its concave area is severely dented. There are evident burn skid marks trailing behind the craft and the craft itself looks to be made of some metallic material. The craft is apparently 96 meters long while the trail it left behind it is nearly 450 meters long so clearly it was a really rough landing. And finally at number 1 is the debated, so even though this one has been debunked I put it as number 1 because it was so widely believed to be an alien crash landing site for so long before you know it obviously wasn't. Now the satellite image shows a mountainous island off the coast of Antarctica. Now in the smooth snow there's a block of something that's crashed into the snow leaving a long deep trail behind it. I mean and I get the allegation, it's narrow and how often do things really crash into Antarctica unless it's a 
UFO from this list clearly so I get why the thought was there and the trail is quite long but if you follow the trail back you'll see the trail goes back to a mountain peak and a bunch of disturbed snow and how many times did I just say trail in the last 30 seconds? Now people believe an avalanche occurred and debris was what the object was or perhaps it was a trapped submarine, I don't really know. Either way, debunked, finally. And we're kicking off this list with the Navy UFO sighting. So back in 2020, the Pentagon released video footage taken by United States Naval aviators of strange objects hurling through the sky. They moved in ways no known aircraft does and pilots described them uh, seeming to defy the laws of physics. In these series of videos, they're completely confused and shocked about what they're seeing. The videos were recorded back in 2004, so the Pentagon were holding on to these for a long time. And the fact that they were finally released really says something about how much of this could be going on. They can't keep it under wraps any longer. It's getting to the point now where even the government is like, yeah, people kind of need to be informed about at least some of it. I mean, who knows what they're still uh, hiding though. If you're liking the channel so far, by the way, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We got awesome content coming at you on the daily. At number nine is the Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting. This is one of the most important UFO sightings in history. It happened on June 24th, 1947, and is a pivotal event in the history of UFOs. Now, NASA has not been established at this point, but the event made a huge impact on government policy regarding unidentified flying objects. Kenneth Arnold, a private pilot, reported seeing nine strange crescent-shaped objects flying in a V formation near Mount Rainer in Washington. He estimated their speed at around 1,700 miles per hour, much faster than any known aircraft at the time. And Arnold's sighting received widespread media coverage, leading to increased public interest in UFOs. And this event is often considered the first modern-day UFO encounter. In the following weeks, there were numerous reports of UFO sightings across the United States leading to the coining of the term flying saucer. This case also had a huge impact on government and military agencies. The U.S. Air Force initiated Project SIGN, the first official government investigation into UFOs. This eventually led to the formation of Project Blue Book, a long-running study of UFO sightings. So, this sighting not only heavily contributed to the curiosity surrounding UFOs and aliens that uh, continues to this day in pop culture, but also contributed to the scientific inquiry and government policy when it comes to UAPs. Next up, we have Frank Shaw's Gargoyle. So this one isn't your standard UAP in that it's a winged cryptid sighting, but it, it was seen by multiple NASA employees at the time, primarily Frank Shaw, who worked in Houston's John Space Center. On the night of the incident, Shaw was on his way back to his car at the end of his shift when he spotted something strange. It was what looked to be a massive winged humanoid creature perched on one of the space center buildings, almost like a gargoyle or bat creature. And suddenly it started unfurling its wings, which Shaw described making this crackling sound before it swooped into the air. Shaw was just stunned, unable to move, having no reference for what he had just witnessed. Suddenly he snapped out of it though, and he rushed to his car. Now, if this were just a one-time thing, I'd be like, all right, maybe he was just really tired, maybe he just saw something totally innocuous and just freaked himself out, yada yada, but it wasn't just a one-time thing. There were other employees at the station who had also encountered a winged creature. Apparently, there had even been a file opened on the thing. Just a few months before, Shah saw it after two German shepherds at the station had been found completely torn apart, and they were found in the same area that Shaw saw the creature. Number seven, dancing lights. On January 29th, 2023, Canadian air traffic controllers and pilots couldn't identify two white lights moving in a circular pattern reported over Canada's Northwest Territories. Good evening, just wondering, do you got two planes that are just to the east of your field doing circuits or maneuvers? A crew member aboard a Canadian North flight headed to Yellowknife asked air traffic controllers. Negative, I have no reported traffic in the area. The Yellowknife air traffic controller replied, do you have a visual 
rule on something? The crew responded somewhat hesitantly, yeah, we're looking at two lights dancing around here to the east of your field. They're above us about I don't know what. We're not seeing them on the TCAS, traffic collision avoidance system, but we can see lights moving around. Then there's a pause before the crew member on the radio back say, we're not crazy. No, we believe you, the air traffic controller replies, and the sighting remains unexplained. Number six, over New Mexico. On February 21st, 2021, a pilot flying over New Mexico at the altitude of 37,000 feet reported seeing a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type thing moving really fast over the top of them according to published audio. American Airlines confirmed that the radio transmission came from flight 2292. The FAA a few days later stated, a pilot reported seeing an object over New Mexico shortly after noon local time on Sunday, February 21st, 2021. FAA air traffic controllers did not see any objects in the area of their radar scopes. Seems like air traffic can never see these objects, but the pilots can, and I can't tell if that's better or worse. Number five, the coin incident. At 7.30 p.m. on October 18th, 1973, American Airlines Flight 21 encountered a UFO near Mansfield, Ohio, and reported it. This would be the first of dozens of sightings reported in that area that night. However, the most astonishing one took place three hours later and became known as the coin incident. Sometime after 10.30 p.m., an Army Reserve helicopter piloted by Captain Lawrence Coyne and a crew of three men was flying from Columbus to Cleveland when somewhere around Mansfield, they noticed a red light on the horizon. They then realized that the object was heading straight for them at a high rate of speed. Coyne quickly descended to avoid collision, but as the men were preparing for impact, the object came to a halt in front of them and projected a green pyramid-shaped beam over the helicopter. At the same time this was happening, the men reported the helicopter being pulled up towards the UFO. However, it then let go and darted out of sight. The incident lasted five minutes. The men described a gray metallic looking dome shaped object with a red light on one end and white light on the other. Now interestingly, after the incident, according to one crew member, the helicopter never worked right again. Now this whole incident was seen from the ground by a mother and her two children who pulled their car over to watch what was going on. They reported seeing the helicopter chasing an object they said looked like a blimp, pear shaped and as big as a school bus. Number four. Trumbull County UFO Incident Featured on the History Channel and numerous UFO documentaries, the Trumbull County UFO Incident in Northeast Ohio is exceptional because it was witnessed by numerous police officers and a 911 dispatcher, all of whom were being recorded as they spoke back and forth about the strange events unfolding on the evening of December 14th, 1994. It was also seen by many members of the public as well. Now around midnight, Trumbull County 911 began receiving calls from residents about a strange low-flying light in the Sky. The dispatcher sent out Liberty Township police officers to investigate, and one of them was Sergeant Toby Maloro, who saw a light. He got out of his car and looked up to see what he described as a giant circular shaped object and intensely bright in the center section. It made no sound at all, and the object was there for about 30 seconds before moving away. Shaken, the sergeant decided to chase the object, as did many other police officers in the area. In total, at least 14 law enforcement officers saw the object at night, with all of them discussing it openly on their radios. Number three, Navy pilots. Recently, two former Navy pilots were interviewed by 60 Minutes on CBS News about a UFO sighting over the Pacific Ocean in 2004. Commander Dave Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Alex Dietrich spotted the unidentified object during a training exercise, but were unable to classify it. Dave described it as a little white tic-tac looking object, adding that it lacked conventional exhaust plumes and had no wings or visible markings. It also moved erratically, the pilot said. In an interview with NBC News, Dave described the 2004 encounter, calling the object the strangest, most obscure thing I've ever seen flying. As soon as we look down, we see the white water, and then we see this white tic-tac. It's pointing north-south, and it's just going forward, back, left, right, he said, adding that it was bouncing around like a ping-pong ball. Dave said he approached the mysterious object to take a closer look, and it began mirroring his movements. Then when the pilot got within half a mile of the UFO, it suddenly vanished. My question is, what was he going to do if he got closer? This whole story is just crazy. Number two, multiple objects in the sky. Ryan Graves, a former Navy pilot who testified that he witnessed UAP with his own eyes, has called on President 
President Joe Biden to investigate the mysterious object spotted in American airspace. Ryan, a former fighter pilot, explained that after 2014, when upgrades were made to our radar system, our squadron made a startling discovery. There were unknown objects in our airspace. And these were not mere balloons like the Chinese spy balloon that dominated the country's attention in February. These are no mere balloons, they could hold their position, appearing motionless, despite category 4 hurricane force winds of 120 knots. They did not have any visible means of lift or control surfaces, in other words, nothing that resembled normal aircraft with wings, flaps, or engines. These are not isolated incidents, Ryan said. We have a real UFO problem, and it's not balloons. The point is that we don't have a clear understanding of what's above our heads as we thought we did. There are uncertainties up there that we have to deal with. If we don't do it, our adversaries are going to take advantage of that uncertainty, that weakness, to spy on us with various means, as we've seen. It's pretty clear. If there are things over our head and we're not sure what they are, well, we need to figure it out. If they're adverse role, it's a national security issue, we have mechanisms for that. If it's not a national security issue, then it's not an adverse role platform, then it's a matter for scientific inquiry. No, I'm not gonna lie, this scares me a little bit. And coming at number one is leaked video. A leaked Navy video captured in July 2019 showed a sphere-shaped unidentified object flying over water near San Diego. The footage obtained by a documentary filmmaker and shared with NBC News appeared to show a mysterious object flying for a few minutes before disappearing into the water. The video was captured by a Navy aircraft and recorded in the USS Almsa Combat Information Center, according to the filmmaker Jeremy Corbell. The clip appears to show a spherical object flying above the water for a few minutes near San Diego before it vanishes. It splashed, military personnel can be heard saying in the video. The Defense Department confirmed that the clip was recorded by Navy personnel and said it will be reviewed by the Pentagon's Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, a panel established last year to gain insight into the nature and origins of such objects. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Disclosure Project. The Disclosure Project is a non-profit organization founded in 1993 by Dr. Stephen M. Greer, who was a physician and UFOologist, and the goal of the project is to bring forth information about the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and their interactions with humanity to the public and government officials. The organization has collected over 800 witness testimonies from military, government, and intelligence officials who have had direct involvement with UFO sightings and extraterrestrial encounters. Literally, this entire group is aimed at doing exactly what we're here talking about today. The Disclosure Project believes that governments around the world have been suppressing information about the existence of extraterrestrial life and that the truth needs to be disclosed to the public. We love a little whistleblowing. They advocate for the declassification of government files related to UFO sightings and for public hearings on the issue. The organization has received criticism and skepticism from some who believe their claims are unfounded. However, the Disclosure Project continues to push for transparency and the release of information to help us better understand our place in the universe. Did you see those James Webb photos? How are we supposed to understand our place in the universe? All right, when the universe is that big, buddy, still processing it. In our number nine spot today, we have the Chilean UFO. Okay, so it turns out that there's been a lot of UFOs spotted in Chile, and the government isn't exactly shy about releasing some of the footage. In 2010, the Chilean government released a series of UFO footage that has since become one of the most compelling pieces of evidence in the history of the phenomenon. The incident began in November 2010 when Chile's National Agency for UFO Research received reports of strange objects in the sky over the country's capital, Santiago. The agency then requested the assistance of the Chilean Air Force to investigate the sightings. The Air Force dispatched a team of experienced pilots to investigate the objects, which had been picked up on radar. The pilots were able to track the objects and capture video footage using advanced equipment. The footage showed multiple objects flying in formation at high speeds, performing maneuvers that seemed impossible, really, for any known aircraft. After careful and analysis, the Chilean government concluded that the objects were not weather balloons, they were not aircrafts, or any other known objects. While the government did not explicitly state that the objects were extraterrestrial in nature, the incident has been widely regarded as one of the most credible pieces of evidence in support of the existence of UFOs. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Go Faster video. In 2017, after the existence of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program became 
more well known, a video was released of an encounter between an FA-18 Super Hornet and some sort of unidentified flying object. This encounter wasn't actually supposed to be released initially, but the New York Times allegedly leaked it, so the government didn't really have much of a choice and decided to release it themselves. This video was the third in a series of three videos. We will talk about another one later on in this list. With this particular video, there weren't a ton of details released about exactly what happened during this encounter, but using the Raytheon Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared Pod, they were able to capture an extremely fast moving white oval that was around 45 feet long. The oval had no wings and didn't appear to have any kind of exhaust either. They were tracking the UFO at an altitude of 25,000 feet just above the Atlantic Ocean and they were shocked as the craft rotated on its axis and flew away. There was no explanation released with the footage because it truly is unbelievable and currently unexplainable. At number seven, we have high altitude objects. So the story here is that several mysterious high altitude objects were down in February of 2023 over various airspaces. You probably remember this in the news. We had objects being spotted over Canada and the United States, Latin America, China, Eastern Europe. Started when several unidentified objects were down over Alaska, the Yukon and Lake Huron. The general of NORAD, Glenn D. Van Herc, made a statement saying the objects could be benign, but wasn't 100% sure. When asked if they could be of alien origin though, he said he wasn't ruling anything out. It literally seems like government and military agencies are just starting to become more open to the idea of extraterrestrial life, or maybe some of them already are fully aware of their presence. Either way though, it seems like they're being discussed openly more than ever before. It's not being written off as nonsense like it has been in the past. And here's another interesting part of these cases. There were recovery attempts made. Unfortunately, the objects landed in areas that aren't all that accessible though, so it made it pretty difficult and the recovery missions were abandoned. Now, that's what they say, but what if the government did recover something that they, they just aren't ready or willing to show us? Who knows? At our number six spot, we have Amuamua. This one's definitely been talked about plenty of times, including on this channel, but it's a recent article dated March 7th of this year that I'm mostly referring to. In a recent article written by Sean Kirkpatrick, head of the Pentagon's AARO, or All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which specializes in unidentified flying objects, and Harvard professor A.V. Loeb, they discussed the possibility that objects like Amuamua, spotted back in 2017, could be of alien origin. The article said that objects like the Oumuamua could be quote unquote a parent craft that releases many small probes during its close passage to Earth. They didn't just discuss the Oumuamua though, they were looking at a variety of unidentified probes. And they went on to speculate that these crafts could potentially power their batteries from starlight and that Earth's water could be fuel. There's some pretty wild stuff in there and yes, a lot of it is speculative, but the fact that it, a highly respected scientist that spent 20 years studying physics is proposing these kinds of ideas. It's pretty fascinating. Coming at number five, we have the Alaska sighting. The event began when Japan Airlines Flight 1628, a cargo plane, reported encountering an unidentified flying object during its flight. The pilot, Captain Kenju Teruchi, and his crew described seeing a massive disc-shaped object with glowing lights flying in close proximity to their aircraft while flying over Alaska. They also reported that the object displayed erratic movements, seemingly defying the laws of physics. And Ground radar stations at Anchorage International Airport even tracked an unidentified craft that matched the flight's description. The radar data not only confirmed the presence of an unknown object, but also its proximity to the airplane. And after the incident, all of the data, including the radar records, was reportedly collected and presented at a meeting with officials from the FBI and the CIA. According to witnesses, these government agencies acknowledged the radar recording as evidence of a genuine UFO, but they later disavowed any knowledge 
of such a meeting. Number four, the Richard French sighting. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Richard French was an investigator for Project Blue Book in the 1950s. Long after retirement at a citizen hearing on disclosure in 2013, French made a shocking statement. His job had been to solve cases involving supposed UFOs, usually by debunking them, but as it turns out, he had actually seen one himself, although he uh, hadn't included it in his report at the time. The 83 year old described an incident that took place during an investigation off the coast of St. John's, Newfoundland back in the day. Two mysterious aircrafts had reportedly crashed into the water. He had followed a group of about a hundred onlookers on a nearby wharf and described seeing two to three foot tall beings, thin and gray, looking to be repairing their vessels. He then watched in awe as the crafts rose out of the water before flying off at incredible speeds. Next up we have the Phoenix Lights. On March 13th, 1997 in Phoenix, Arizona, USA, thousands of residents reported seeing a series of strange lights in the sky. The lights were described as bright and hovering slowly in a V-shaped formation. This event unfolded in two parts. First, there were reports of lights moving slowly across the state from the northern to the southern region. Then later in the evening, a stationary V-shaped formation appeared over Phoenix and lingered for several minutes before vanishing. The official explanation initially attributed to the lights was a military flares being dropped during a training exercise, but this explanation didn't match the descriptions given by witnesses who reported a massive silent object blocking out the stars. Some speculated it was a UFO, while others believed it to be a secret military aircraft. At our number two spot, we have the Rendlesham Forest Incident. The Rendlesham Forest Incident, also known as Britain's Roswell, is one of the most well documented UFO events in history. It occurred in late December of 1980 near Royal Air Force Woodridge or RAF Woodridge, a US Air Force base located in Suffolk, England. Over a couple nights, multiple military personnel reported encountering strange lights and objects in the forest adjacent to the base. On the night of December 26, 1980, US Air Force personnel, including Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, investigated reports of unusual lights in Rendlesham Forest. They witnessed strange colored lights in the sky and on the ground. Halt recorded his observations on an audio tape describing the lights as red, green, and blue, and confirmed the presence of an unidentified craft. Two nights earlier, on December 24, 1980, security personnel at RAF Woldridge reported seeing a triangular shaped object with red and blue lights hovering above the forest. It appeared to land and leave impressions on the ground. And when radiation readings were allegedly taken at the site, it indicated unusually high levels. And finally, we have the 1952 Washington DC UFO incident, also known as the Washington Flap. During two consecutive weeks in July of 1952, a series of UFO sightings occurred in the airspace over Washington, D.C. On the night of July 19, 1952, radar operators at Washington National Airport detected a cluster of these unknown objects flying at very high speeds. Witnesses on the ground reported seeing bright lights moving erratically in the sky. Similar sightings recurred on the night of July 20th, prompting the U.S. Air Force to scramble fighter jets in pursuit of these objects, pilots reported seeing the objects visually, describing them as glowing lights that defied the laws of physics with their sudden accelerations and maneuvers. The CIA took a keen interest in this case, conducting its own investigation. Declassified documents have since revealed that the CIA closely monitored the events and requested daily briefings on the sightings. To this day, these sightings have not been fully explained. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the 1976 Tehran incident. The 1976 Tehran UFO incident is a notable case in UFOlogy that took place on September 19th, 1976. The incident involved a luminous object that was observed hovering over the city by two F-4 Phantom II jet interceptors of the Iranian Air Force. The object was detected on radar and appeared to be capable of jamming the communication systems of the jets. The pilots reported that they saw a brightly lit diamond-shaped object that emitted a green light and they attempted to engage it with missiles. However, the 
object evaded their attempts and quickly disappeared. At a pilot's conference in 2007, one of the pilots in this incident, Parviz Jafari, said he attempted to fire at the UFO, but something strange was preventing him from doing so. He said, quote, My weapons jammed and my radio communications garbled. The incident was investigated by the Iranian government and the US Defense Intelligence Agency, and it has been the subject of much speculation and debate among UFO enthusiasts. Some argue that the incident was evidence of extraterrestrial activity, while others suggest it may have been a secret military experiment or some kind of atmospheric phenomenon. Despite the official investigation, the incident remains unresolved and its true nature remains a mystery. In our number 9 spot today, we have the McMinnville UFO photographs. The McMinnville UFO photographs are a series of two photographs taken by Paul and Evelyn Trent on May 11, 1950 in McMinnville, Oregon. The photos depict a metallic disc-shaped object in the sky with trees and buildings visible in the foreground. The Trents claimed that they saw the object hovering in the sky and were able to capture it on camera. The photographs quickly gained widespread attention and were widely circulated in newspapers and magazines, and they were also examined by several experts including the US Air Force, which conducted an investigation known as Project Blue Book. Famous, famous project here on Most Amazing Top 10. The Trents maintained that the photographs were genuine and that they had not tampered with them in any way. However, some skeptics have suggested that the photographs may have been hoaxed or that the objects in the photographs were just a common object. Despite the controversy surrounding the photographs, however, they remain one of the most famous and well-known UFO sightings in history. The photographs have been the subject of numerous articles, books, and documentaries, and have inspired countless discussions and debates about the existence of UFOs and extraterrestrial life. In our number 8 spot today, we have the USS Nimitz Tic Tac UFO incident. This UFO sighting comes from 2004. On November 14th of that year, the USS Princeton noticed an unknown aircraft of some sort that was about 100 miles off of the coast of San Diego. For two weeks prior to this, the crew had been tracking a strange flying object that would start out at about 80,000 feet before extremely quickly dropping to hover right above the Pacific Ocean. Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate went over in two fighter jets and when they arrived, they saw what at first appeared to be churning water while there was an oval shape just below the surface. After this, the white oval shaped object appeared above the water, but it had no markings on it. Like no windows, nothing that would indicate an engine, no wings, and the infrared monitors on the jets didn't pick up any sort of exhaust. The commander and lieutenant commander tried to intercept this strange aircraft, but it very quickly flew away and reappeared on the monitor 60 miles away. And when I say quickly, I mean it was moving at three times the speed of sound and over twice the speed of the fighter jets. So, faster than any kind of technology we currently have. We still don't know exactly what it was, but it certainly was beyond our current capabilities. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Phoenix Lights. The Phoenix Lights UFO incident occurred on March 13th, 1997, when thousands of people in Arizona reported seeing a series of bright lights in the sky in a V-shaped formation. Eyewitnesses described the lights as silent and moving slowly across the sky. The event gained significant media attention and became one of the most well-known UFO sightings in history. Some skeptics dismissed it as flares or a military exercise, but many other witnesses remained convinced that they had witnessed something otherworldly. One of the most interesting witnesses in this case is former Arizona Governor Fife Symington. In 2007, he decided to reveal that he had seen the object himself, and not only this, but he described it as not from this world. Despite the multiple witnesses in this government officials testimony, the incident remains a mystery and to this day, no official explanation has been given for the strange lights seen in the sky. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Project Blue Book sighting. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Richard French was once tasked with being an investigator for Project Blue Book, which was the name used to describe a study of UFOs conducted by the United States Air Force from March 1952 to December 17, 1969, when the project was terminated. While his job was meant to be to investigate and essentially debunk UFO sightings, later in life he took to Congress to stand up and explain his own UFO encounter that he was never 
able to explain away. The moment that truly stuck with him all of these years took place back in 1952. He was sent off to Newfoundland after there were reports that a UFO had crashed off of the coast of St. John's. As he arrived to the scene, there were at least 100 people who all stood and stared into the water, and as he was able to follow their gaze and see what they were all looking at, he couldn't believe his eyes. He recalled the water being quite clear, and under it you could see two circular crafts, each one approximately 18 feet in diameter. He said that they were both floating just below the surface of the water, no more than 20 feet from the shore, and not only this, but he could also see two beings with the crafts. He said, quote, the first thing I saw was the UFOs, and it was apparent to me that they were doing something to the craft, and I couldn't really tell what because they were on the bottom side of it and not visible to me, except when they would occasionally get over to the side where I could see them. He claimed he watched on as the beings worked on the craft until one of them raised out of the water and disappeared, but not before accelerating to speeds in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 miles an hour. In our number five spot today, we have the Coin Mansfield incident. The Coyne Mansfield helicopter incident occurred on October 18, 1973, when four members of the Ohio Army National Guard were flying in a helicopter over Mansfield, Ohio. Suddenly, they encountered a large metallic disc-shaped object that was hovering in the sky. The object began to move towards the helicopter, causing the crew to take evasive maneuvers. Despite their efforts, the object continued to follow them, eventually passing overhead and disappearing into the distance. The crew reported the incident to their superiors and an investigation was launched by the military and the Federal Aviation Administration. The incident received significant media attention and it remains one of the most compelling UFO sightings on record. What makes this incident particularly intriguing is the credibility of the witnesses. The crew were experienced pilots with military training and their account of the incident was corroborated by radar data and other witnesses on the ground. Despite the extensive investigations, no satisfactory explanation has ever been offered for what they saw that day. In our number four spot today, we have the Congress report. For this one, we are talking about a recent report that was delivered to Congress from the Director of National Intelligence. Basically, since August of last year, there has been a total of 510 unidentified aerial phenomena observed in protected airspace or near sensitive facilities. According to the report, 26 of these were described as drones, 160 three were labeled as balloons or balloon-like entities, and six were described as clutter, whatever that means. This is all fine and well, but the concern sets in when we consider that this leaves 171 sightings unaccounted for, some of which, quote, appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities. It's also important to note that the majority of these sightings are coming directly from Navy and Air Force pilots. Here's the thing. What we, as the public know, is only a 12-page declassified summary of the actual, real, secret report that was delivered to Congress. Only time will tell if we ever find out what the rest of the report includes or what will happen with further investigation into the 171 sightings, but hopefully if answers do arise one day, we'll find out. In our number three spot today, we have the advanced technology. So this UFO sighting comes from a while ago, but it just recently became quite relevant and that is because some former U.S. Air Force personnel have begun explaining to the Pentagon that they believe back in the 60s there were UFOs that supposedly had the ability to turn off their nuclear warheads. Apparently, these officers recently told this to the government's all-domain anomaly resolution office, who had contacted former Air Force ICBM launch officer Robert Salas to get information about the encounter with an orange flying disc that switched off 10 warheads at Maelstrom Air Force Base, Montana in 1963. There was another former officer, Dr. Robert Jacobs, who also apparently told the AARO that he had gone as far as to make a film of the UFO for the Air Force in 1964, and that this film captured images of a UFO shooting a test missile out of the sky. With the P-51 
piquing interest in UFOs and the potential for an advanced civilization apart from our own, it appears as though the government is spending more time now researching and looking into these claims because, well, why would they make them up and then continue on with the same story some 50 years later? In our number two spot today, we have the USS Nimitz Tic Tac UFO incident. This UFO sighting comes from 2004. On November 14th of that year, the USS Princeton noticed an unknown aircraft of some sort that was about 100 miles off of the coast of San Diego. For two weeks prior to this, this crew had been tracking a strange flying object that would start out at around 80,000 feet before extremely quickly dropping to hover right above the Pacific Ocean. Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate went over in two fighter jets and when they arrived they saw what at first appeared to be churning water while there was an oval shape just below the surface. After this, a white oval shaped object appeared above the water but it had no markings on it. Like no windows, nothing that would indicate an engine, no wings, and the infrared monitors on the jets didn't pick up any sort of exhaust. The commander and lieutenant commander tried to intercept this strange aircraft, but it very quickly flew away and reappeared on the monitor 60 miles away. And when I say quickly, I mean that it was moving at three times the speed of sound and over twice the speed of the fighter jets. So faster than any kind of technology we currently have. We still don't know exactly what it was, but it certainly was beyond our current capabilities. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Roswell incident. This incident is like the mecca when it comes to a government leak. I mean, this incident is infamous for a reason. The whole thing started in 1947 when some sort of crash took place near a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. Shortly after this, the Roswell Army Airfield released a statement saying that they had recovered a flying disc from the ranch, but the Army quickly retracted the statement and said that it wasn't that, but instead it was just a conventional weather balloon. So it was a little sketchy, but most people just let it slide until the 1970s. What happened in the 70s is that a retired lieutenant colonel began to speak out. In an interview with a UFO researcher, he said that the weather balloon story was a cover up and that alien remains were actually recovered from the crash site. There were both first and second hand witnesses who claimed that not only were there at least one, but possibly more alien spacecrafts that had crashed at the sea but also that extraterrestrial remains were recovered by the military who then began to engage in a cover-up. In 1994, the story changed from a weather balloon to a nuclear test surveillance balloon from Project Mogul, and it was stated that the stories of the alien bodies were probably just test dummies that had been dropped from high altitudes. I'm not gonna lie, the whole thing sounds a little sketchy. I obviously wasn't there, so I can't say for certain what happened, but someone is definitely lying about it. That's what I know. If you enjoyed these UFO crash sites, then you will guys will for sure enjoy these mysterious alien photos that were stolen from secret military archives. Do aliens exist? Find out for yourself by clicking now.